So welcome everyone to the ZPNC stream. Um, in this session, we're very lucky to have Peter Enrico uh, from Enterprise Performance Strategies. Uh, he'll be uh, talking us through latent demand in the mainframe environment. Um, this session is uh, 6AZ, so please do remember that code when you're leaving the session feedback at the end. Um, I'll also paste in the chat box uh, the direct link so that you can leave the feedback. We'd also appreciate um, any donations to our nominated charities, which is RNLI and Guide Dogs for the Blind. Uh, we're, we're almost 100% of our target. And yeah, we, if, you, if you've been enjoying the GSC conference so far, yeah, we'd, we'd greatly appreciate um, that as well. In terms of questions and answers, if you do have any questions, please uh, type them away in the chat box and uh, Peter will, uh, you know, he, he will um, answer them throughout the presentation. So uh, with that in mind, uh, over to you, Peter. Wow, thank you very much. And hello, everybody. I hope you're all having a good day. Now, I know this is on UK time, which I think is 1030 there right now. So it's 530 for me. So hopefully I'm, uh, I'm good enough at 530 for you folks. Um, yes, thank you. My name is Peter Enrico of Enterprise Performance Strategies. And today what we're going to talk about is evaluating latent demand in the mainframe environment. And I just want to really thank GSC for inviting me to uh, present at this conference. I, I, I miss everybody. I just want to let you know that I'm, I'm looking forward to when we can start doing these uh, conferences in person again. Uh, we were just commiserating about that. And so just hope I get to see you all next year in person. Um, yes, this is about the GSE uh, charities, so I just wanted to point that out to you, as, as was mentioned. And just real quick commercials, real fast. Uh, just as you know, if you want to know what we do for a living, what I do for a living, we have our Pivoter, uh, SMF, Decollect, whatever, whatever performance reporting service. So if you're looking for a, a performance reporting service along with our services of MSU reduction and whatnot, just think of us. We do our educational workshops. I do want to point out that we have three classes we teach, our basic tuning class, which is taught by my colleague, Scott Chapman, our parallel systemplex class, which is a two-day class being given next week, and that's all virtual. And then there's our workload manager class. And what's interesting about all of our classes is you send data before time, and then in the class, you'll be analyzing your own environment. So think of it as a week of learning as well as a week of actually doing you know, an assignment. Uh, we do offer war room consulting services. So if you're ever interested in that, please let us know. And then we also disseminate information. One of the things I would really encourage you to do is join our mailing list. We do about 20 or more educational webinars every year. It's like every two weeks it works out to be about. And we really try to work hard. We work hard to keep them pure educational. So there are about a half an hour followed by Q&A on any subject. So certainly go to our website, which is listed here, and sign up to go to those webinars. You'll just sign up our guest book, really. So I just want to point out that one of the things I did last year is I started a YouTube channel. I've not posted in the last few months because it has been a busy summer and these do take time. But uh, there's a series of web videos out there on YouTube. Just do a search on the mainframe performance or mainframe performance channel or my name. And you'll find those videos out there. Um, I have a whole stack of videos that will be going out over the next few uh, months. And so what I'm trying to do with these videos is make them more interactive as opposed to just voice over a bunch of slides. So enjoy the mainframe performance channel. And if you have any requests for a presentation, certainly don't hesitate to ask. Uh, and then finally, if you like what you see in this particular presentation, always feel free to send us an email and I'll generate a bunch of charts for you and we can sit down and talk about your latent demand. That's something I do in all my presentations. If you want to look at your data, let us know and I will explain the particular presentation in terms of your data. So anyway, what we're doing today is talking about latent demand. And the whole point about latent demand is that we're trying to understand that not just that you're a busy environment, but we want to understand that how much work is backing up waiting to get into the system. So what latent demand is actually defined as, as it says here, is work waiting to get done but can't get done because there's something in the configuration that's preventing it from being dispatched. So something artificial, the resource or something, is holding that workload back from being um, actually executed. And it's typically, what well, we're gonna see in a moment, but a lot of times it's typically due to lack of resources for the workload. And it's usually easy to tell if you have latent demand. I mean, I'm gonna show you some measurements to, to kind of help you give you the main indicators. Um, what's a little bit more difficult to do is to understand how much latent demand you actually have. I mean, I'll be honest with you, most environments, not all, because I work with some really low utilized machines, 
But there are a lot of environments out there. Everybody has some moment in time where you have work backing up. So it's a matter of what degree of latent demand you have and how to look at that degree of latent demand. Do you have like a little bit of latent demand where some work is always backing up? That's not necessarily a bad thing. Or are you one of these environments that just have hundreds if you know hundreds of units of work waiting to use the CPU that are just not getting through? And it's usually that that we're more interested in. Um, so understanding the amount of latent demand and how much more capacity is needed to actually address that latent demand is the more difficult issue. I'm not going to go through all of that because those are certain exercises one have to do. As my friend, as my friend, as my colleague Scott Chapman will say, think of latent demand as people waiting to get on the freeway. You're trying to get onto the road and, and the road's busy, so you have a queue of work waiting to get on the road. Um, this slide is not in your deck, and I can put it in your deck when I uploaded the presentation, but I did want to point out that, because somebody asked me about this recently, is that there is the concept of what we call induced latent demand, which is not something we're going to really be talking about in this particular presentation. And what induced latent demand is, is work that hasn't come into the system, but would come in if there was capacity available. Right? It's the concept of saying that we don't even have this work on the system, but the work may come in had we not had the latent demand. So think of it as, as I'm saying here, you know, ad hoc queries, if we don't have latent demand, then maybe ad hoc queries would come in and then we'd have a lot more queries coming into the system because maybe people would be entering more queries or people would be running more compiles if the compiles were a little bit faster. So the point of the exercise I'm trying to bring out here is that always remember that you have the latent demand and it's easy to solve, the, not easy, you have to be able to solve the latent demand but once the latent demand is being addressed, understand you're still exposed to what we call induced latent demand, which is work that is not coming into the system because people feel, oh, the system's just too busy. I, I can't deal with this right now. I'll submit this work later. Where had that latent demand not been there or you solved the latent demand problem, they might start submitting that work right away. Um, you could think of induced latent demand as going back to my or Scott's uh, highway analogy. These are the people who are staying home because the highway is too busy. But if the highway wasn't busy, they'd be on the road as well. So you always have to remember you have that sort of backup of work. That's not something we're really talking about in this presentation. So when does latent demand build up? Well, latent demand builds up for a number of different reasons at a number of different times. But understand that latent demand is usually a combination of both workloads needing the resources and the amount of resources that are needing to be consumed. So for example, for the resources, given a particular set of uh, demand, workload demands, there's not enough capacity to run those workloads. We have this much workload and much smaller amount of capacity. That is something that induces latent demand. Um, then there's also the case where the workloads, where you have uh, a workload needs a particular amount of capacity. And then if that workload grows or you add a workload to a work uh, to a machine or whatever, that's going to actually cause latent demand as well, because that's now additional demand on the processor. So think of latent demand as being caused by both the limitations of resources, as well as the activity on the system, the workloads on the system and how much workload there actually is. So um, the point here I'm trying to bring out on this slide is why would available resources or workloads demand change? And as we know with our computer systems, as any performance person knows, is that there is never the steady state. I mean, yes, yeah, sometimes we see a steady state environment, but for most times you have different states that uh, cause more latent demand when something happens and less latent demand when, when that, that something isn't happening. So for example, when we think of resources in terms of what causes latent demand, it could be due to machine level constraints. My machine is just not large enough. But it can also be due to logical constraints, like in this case, I'm trying to point out the logical LPAR levels. I mean, you could have a machine that's plenty big, but if you have a LPAR that has a limited number of logical processors, some number of logical processors less than that machine, it could be that the logical limit of the, of the CPUs is the problem and not the physical limit of the machine. That's an example of something that would cause latent demand. Of course, there's capping constraints, which we'll talk about where you're preventing work from coming in for whatever reason, you're either capping a workload or, 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 an, or an entire LPAR. There's of course cases where you have weight enforcement where normally there is enough capacity, but because the other LPARs have demand, the weights are gonna now be enforced and now this uh, LPAR or this set of workloads is not gonna be constrained. Um, there's other things, there's zip crossover. Maybe 
your zips are too busy, there's latent demand on the zip engine, you have crossover turned on, and now you have additional work on your CP CPUs that wasn't normally there, that could cause latent demand if you're doing crossover. And of course, in terms of workloads, nothing's ever steady. We have our typical camel hump uh, curve during the day. So you have your peak times, you have your, your non-peak times, you have your holiday season, you have your bank openings, you have your stock market openings, you have your Black Fridays, whatever is happening is on a seasonal level. And things like failover and business growth, that's all going to cause latent demand because the workloads change over time as well. So before we get into some measurements, how do you alleviate latent demand? This is more the difficult presentation, which we're not gonna really get into here. I might mention some things, but alleviating latent demand is, is a big project in and of itself. It's a big art in and of itself, but the basic constructs of alleviating, alleviating, late, alleviating latent demand is A, you can get more resources, which is not always easy from a financial point of view, but technically speaking, if your machine is really constrained and you're not on IBM's largest machine, you can always get more resources. Of course, you can do less work because if you do less work, that's less pressure on the processors, but you can't always do that either because you're a business you have to run. But technically speaking, if you're able to control the workload or control the path length of those workloads or whatever, you're controlling the amount of work actually trying to get onto the system. Of course, you can do lots of tuning because of course, there's not always the optimized system. So sometimes optimized systems can make it so that latent demand is alleviated. And then take advantage of controls such as capping because when you really think about it, if I just don't have enough resources to handle all of my workloads, why don't I select a particular workload I'm willing to penalize? And by restricting that workload's usage, yes, that workload is building up its latent demand, but the other workloads now have more opportunity. So that's how you address latent demand for resources. Um, and, 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 and for anything really. But regardless of what you do to alleviate latent demand, the very first thing you need to do is understand the latent demand in your environment. Is there a lot or a little? Um, it, what's the patterns of activity? When do you have latent demand? Um, what is causing the latent demand? And what workloads are most affected by those latent demands? And that's what I'm trying to go through in this presentation. And that's what I kind of want to walk through now. So I'm going to try to show you some slides where we look at measurements and to help you understand these particular questions, because knowing how much and what is causing the latent demand is gonna be a big step forward in terms of addressing anything in terms of getting more resources or changing your workloads or tuning or whatnot. So as I said here, let's talk about what's some of the first things we wanna do, find out if you even have latent demand and if so, how much. So one of the first things we like to look at when we look at latent demand is the busyness. Typically, not always, but typically when we think about latent demand, most analysts think in terms of processor, CPU latent demand, because that's our most expensive resource. It's the resource that costs the most money. So as a result, we can't always just increase it. Yes, there's other types of latent demand on storage, there's logical resources, there's IO latent demand, and, 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 and that's all fine, but it's typically processes that we're most interested in. So one of the first things we always do whenever we look at a customer is we just say, how busy is the machine? What's the patterns of activity? Now I'm showing you one particular example here, but just what you wanna do is you wanna look at the patterns of activity of the processor utilization. So in this particular case, what I'm trying to point out is we have, uh, I think this is like a week's worth of data. You see the utilization, you see there's white space, meaning that the machine is not busy at these times. But naturally at this point in time, you see that there's certain periods that where the machine is actually reaching 100% utilization. And there's other times where you see this sort of flatlining occurring. And I think I'm gonna to go to the next slide because this is just sort of zeroing in on this. And the point I'm trying to bring out here is that these are periods of time that we typically have latent demand. If you look at the left-hand side of the slide, where we have, uh, or the chart at least, you have you know, a lot of white space. It doesn't mean the machine is not 100% busy sometimes, but on average for these 15 minute intervals, we're something less than 100% busy. So we probably have a whole lot, late, less, late, lot less latent demand because we have all this white space. But when you see yourself approaching 100% utilization, typically speaking, you're gonna see some latent demand in your environment. Now it could be that we're touching 100% utilization at this point and we're just touching it because we can have very little latent demand and we just happen to have just enough capacity. But another thing we can have happening at this point in time is we have 100% utilization and there's a huge amount of latent demand because 
we get to 100% and the work is still backing up and the work is backing up severely. So we just don't know how much latent demand we have. We just know our processes at 100% utilization. And that's typically a signature of latent demand. But then towards the right hand side of the screen here, we see that we have a flat lining of something less than 100%. And this is usually the signature of something like a cap or a, uh, a, some sort of capping going on on the machine, some sort of capping going on on the LPARs. So it's sort of an artificially induced sort of limitation on the, on the processor. So just wanna point that out, usually 100% utilization or some sort of artificial sort of flatness going on is typically periods of time that we're gonna find our latent demand. Another time we find latent demand is when we look at our LPAR weights. So you can have, you know, your, your, um, you can have your, your machine not be at 100% utilization on average for 15 minutes. But what we do want to understand is during those 15 minutes, are the weights being enforced? What's sort of the trade-off of the weights between one LPAR and another? And so one of the things we like looking at when we do that is we look at the percent of the weight used. So you think to yourself that every LPAR has an LPAR weight and the LPAR weight represents a guaranteed share. So let's say I have an LPAR and its weight, whatever it is, works out to be a guaranteed share of 25%. So let's say all the weights add up to 1,000. This particular LPAR has a weight of 250. That LPAR has a guaranteed share of 25% of this machine. What that means is when the demand for the processor of all the LPARs is, I'm sorry, when the CPU demand of all the LPARs is greater than the capacity of the machine, we know that this LPAR is gonna be guaranteed 25% of the machine, whatever that may be in this case. So what happens is in this particular chart, if you look at our guideline of 100%, what the guideline of 100% means is that this LPAR is using exactly its guaranteed share. So if I, if I have an LPAR that's guaranteed 25% of the machine and it's using exactly 25% of the machine, then it's using 100% of its guaranteed share. If the LPAR doesn't have demand for its full guaranteed share, let's say it only wants to be 50% busy, so it's only using up half of its weight, it's using up 12.5% of, of, the, of the machine, let's say, then you would expect it to be down at the 50% level. And then something that has a guaranteed share of 25% of the box doesn't mean it can't use up more, of course, depending upon the configuration, but let's just say it can use up more, let's say you know, it has the ability to use up much more than it's 25% of the machine. Let's say it uses up 50% of the machine, then it would be using 200% of its weight. Now, the reason I'm going through this is that we use charts like this to understand patterns of activity because latent demand could be caused by, uh, could be induced on this LPAR because of the process of demands of this LPAR and as weights are getting enforced. So when you're above 100, it means you're actually being using more than your guaranteed share when you're less, you, you know, you're using less than your guaranteed share. In this particular example, it's not as interesting, but I do want to point out the circled area where we do see that flat lining, where this is an example, whenever you see a flat lining, or in this particular case, the guy is not even getting his, his guaranteed share. He's getting something less than his guaranteed share. And we see that it's flat lining. So he's probably being capped in this case because he's flat lining at something less than his guaranteed share. Another indicator of latent demand. Um, another indicator in terms of guaranteed share, if I was to see all the LPARs sort of converge at 100%, then that means that the weights are being enforced, and that's another indicator of latent demand. One more indicator of latent demand is when you look at your peaks for the month. So I don't know, you know how people do in their pricing nowadays, but for example, if you're still doing your pricing on the peak of the month, what I'm trying to show you here is that I'm looking at, I think this is uh, maybe a few days worth of data, this is like 11 days worth of data here. What I'm trying to show you is, is that we have our estimated billable MSUs, but the red areas here are our intervals where we hit our peak, our, our maximum MSUs available for this particular LPAR. So in this particular case, if I was looking at this over time, I would probably see latent demand during the periods of time that this LPAR was limited by its peak of the month, whatever that may be caused by. It could be caused by a cap, it could just be caused by the limitations of the machine, or whatever, but in, but what's seen here is that the peak of the month usually indicates, at least when something like this, when you see it flatlining, indicates some sort of latent demand activity. Another area that we look at for latent demand is when we look at the estimated billable MSUs versus the rolling four hour average. And that's what this chart is showing us. Here we have our defined capacity limit if you're using defined capacities. So our defined capacity limit is this horizontal line here. So that's what we're limited to. Our interval one hour MSUs are this yellow line. So that's sort of what we're using on a regular basis. 
And then we see this line here, this sort of green line, which is actually overlapping the blue line. And the first line is the actual rolling for our average. And the other one is the billable rolling for our average or the estimated billable MSUs. So we know the rolling for our average is just gonna be based on, you know, the rolling for our average. So it can go above the defined capacity limit, but because you have defined capacity limit, the estimated billable MSUs are gonna stay at that defined capacity limit, usually due to some sort of capping. So that's the whole concept of work with license charges. So when you see a separation of the estimated billable MSUs from the rolling for our average, yet that's sort of flatlining at the defined capacity limit, that's also a period of time that we usually see some sort of latent demand, and that's what we want to investigate. Um, and then the other thing we want to look at is in this particular case I just showed you is that we're probably capping to induce some sort of latent, you know, this capping to, to honor the workload license, the defined capacity limit is usually causing some sort of latent demand. What we want to understand is if you are actually capping, what is the severity of the, of the, um, of the capping? So in other words, just because you're capped doesn't mean there's going to be latent demand. So in addition to looking at that separation, we sort of have to look at the um, effect of that cap. So for example, here's an example where on the left-hand side, I'm showing you two different measurements. The, the first measurement, which we see here flatlining at the top, is the percentage of the measurement interval that this particular LPAR, uh, right, this particular LPAR is capped, right? So we know the LPAR is capped. If you see it, you know, some, if you see like in this point, I'm pointing here that it's some number less than 100%, it just means it was capped for part of the interval. But what I'm showing you here is that we are continuously capping this LPAR for a period of time. Just because we're capping the LPAR doesn't mean that the work wants to run and there is going to be latent demand. So this is going to help us understand, is there latent demand during our capping period? In this particular case, the other measurement we're looking at is the percent cap limited, or another way of putting it is how much limit is being placed onto the workloads due to this cap. And we see here, it's very low numbers. So this is a case where, yeah, we're being capped, we're capping this LPAR, but it's not really affecting the workloads. The workloads really don't have that much demand during this period of time. So don't just think because you're capped, you're going to get the latent demand. Here's another example. And, and by the way, what I'm showing you on the right-hand side here is CPU delay samples. So you can see the CPU delay samples by workload. And we see that they're relatively small numbers. So even though we're capped, we don't really see a huge amount of CPU delay. In this particular case, we're looking at the same value for a different time period, different LPAR actually. And this LPAR2 is capped. Again, if you see it capped in the middle here, it just means it's capped for part of the interval. But what you notice here is the percent capped limited is basically the same as the cap amount. And this is an example where not only was the LPAR capped, for, but for every interval that the LPAR was capped, the workloads had full demand for all the capacity of that cap. So this is a case where we probably understand that the workload is actually being capped. And then you see here on the right-hand side, the corresponding time period when we see the CPU delay samples. And what do you know? The CPU delay increases when we're being capped because the workloads actually have demand for that period of time. So remember, just because you're capped doesn't mean you're affecting the workloads and we can tell whether or not that's causing latent demand because in this case it is because we see the CPU delay during our capping period and we see the percent cap limited is quite high. And of course, it could also be something in the middle here. It could be that you know, I'm capped 100% of in the interval, but I only am, you know, delayed or percent limited by 50%, which means, yeah, I'm capped to the full interval, but I only really needed 50% of the capacity during that capped interval. So those are just indicators of when you have latent demand. What I want to look at now is actually looking at measuring the amount of latent demand we have, okay? So let me just look here at the chat real quickly, because I see I have a question, because I said questions. Okay, so that's just... Uh, Okay, that's just about the charity. Okay, so um, what we're doing here is another indicator we want to look at when we have latent demand is looking at LPAR busy versus MVS percent busy. And this is also an indicator of how the severity of latent demand. I don't want to go into this in too much detail, but I just want to point out that there's one line I'm pointing to here with this box is our LPAR utilization which is gonna be how busy this particular LPAR is keeping its logical engines, where the previous example was how busy the LPARs were keeping the physical engines. And the other line we have here is this orange line at the top, which is our MVS busy time percentage. And think of the MVS busy time percentage as being the, 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 the demand for CPU that this particular LPAR had. Another way of putting it is 
the LPAR was this busy, which is the lower line, but it wanted to be this busy. And the larger the separation of those two values, typically the more latent demand we have. Why is that? Is just to real quickly go through what these two numbers mean is as everybody probably knows since you're ZOS performance people, we have the LPAR is being dispatched to uh, the physical machine. So every logical processor is being dispatched to a physical processor on the LPAR. And when a logical processor is associated with a physical processor, it is called dispatched and PRISM is doing it for a fixed amount of time called the dispatch interval, okay? Well, what's happening here is that the MVS operating system is keeping two timing values and that's what's calculating these two different utilizations. The first timing value is what we call our logical dispatch time. In other words, how much time did the LPAR actually use the logical processor? Because remember, in a PRISM environment, unless you have something called weight completion equals yes, which nobody does anymore, or dedicated processors, in a PRISM environment, when a logical processor is associated with a physical processor, it means that that CPU is busy because the MVS system wants to keep that CPU busy. As soon as the MVS system goes into a wait state, PRISM is not going to keep that logical processor associated with the physical process. He's going to take it away right away. So that means the dispatch time of the LPAR is equal to the amount of time that that LPAR was busy. And that's what this one number means here, this lower line means here. It means when the CPU was dispatched, when the LPAR was dispatched, it was keeping the logical processor busy. And when it's not busy, it gets undispatched. So that period of time is called the dispatch interval or the time used. And that's what we're looking at here in this green line. But the other thing that can happen is you have this dispatch interval that I mentioned. Now you can use not the full dispatch interval, which means I go into a wait state. So this black line here is equal to my LPAR utilization. I, I don't use the full dispatch interval. But if I use the full dispatch interval, then naturally my, MV, my LPAR busy time is gonna be the dispatch interval itself because as soon as I am at the end of the dispatch interval, LPAR is gonna take away the CPU. So the amount of CPU you're using is either part of the dispatch interval or exactly the dispatch interval, but that's what LPAR utilization is based on. What MVS utilization is based on is the time until the LPAR goes into a wait state. So one of two things can happen there. You get dispatch, which I'm showing here on the left. And again, we're, we're using the CPU, but as MVS is running, it's running along. The MVS clock for the MVS utilization is running along. And when LPAR no longer wants to use the CPU, he goes into a wait state or the, the system goes into a wait state. LPAR takes the CPU away from him. The amount of time that the LPAR wanted to run was the time run until he went into a wait state. That's this orange line. And that's what MVS utilization is based on. Down here, I'm showing you the same thing, but I'm showing you that by the time we get to the end of the dispatch interval, MVS still has not gone into a wait state, but we've used the full dispatch interval. In this case, Prism is gonna take away the CPU, so the black line is our LPAR utilization, but because MVS has not gone into a wait state, this particular clock keeps on progressing until it goes into a wait state, so naturally this time is gonna be longer. Why it doesn't go into a wait state is because Prism is not giving it the CPU. And that's the reason you see the separation of these two numbers is that they're two different values, time dispatched and time until going into a wait. When you see a delta between those two times, there's usually latent demand. And that's what I that's explained on this slide. Um, I'm just gonna skip over this. What I was talking about here, and I think Gabriel Goth is on this call. Um, he kind of showed me that one of the interesting measurements is also looking at LPAR utilization and MVS utilization based on the unparked engines only as opposed to the parked engines. And that's gonna change the calculation a little bit. And you actually see that the two numbers converge a little bit differently. So um, that's what this talks about, but I'm gonna go past this only for time period. Um, another thing that we look at for latent demand or wanna actually measure the amount of latent demand is looking at the work units being dispatched. So everybody knows that you have some number of logical processors and you have things that want to use the CPU and we call these work units. Examples of work units are TCBs and SRBs and which are basically PGM equals of your batch job or your, your, your DB2 threads or whatever. They basically boil down to TCBs and SRBs, but they want to be dispatched. We call those work units. Now it's not the same as an address space in the past, People used to measure the number of address spaces waiting to use the CPU. That's not very interesting. What we're interested in is looking at the number of units of work waiting to use the CPU. 
and those are working the queuing. So we want to understand that if we have latent demand, we know work is queuing up, waiting to use those CPUs. How backed up is that queue of work? And so we look at that using a series of measurements that are available to us. The first set of measurements that are available to us to looking at the number of work units is the min-max average number of work units waiting to use the CPU, right? So you have some number of CPUs, you have the work units on this queue. So the data gatherers like CMF and RMF go in and they're constantly measuring the queue depth. And when they do that, they're able to then calculate that during this 15 minute period of time, this was the biggest queue found, this was the smallest queue found, and this is the average queue length found. And that's what we're looking at here. There's different ways to interpret this graph and we use this differently. Um, so for example, in this particular case, the upper line is our maximum work units. And we see it going up and down, not huge numbers, but we see it going up and down. But typically when that sort of pattern occurs, it's that there's a burst of activity that comes in as opposed to a sustained amount of, of activity. When you see the minimum uh, number of work units go down to zero and you have some average here, it usually means, yes, we regularly have a constant amount of work, but on, you know, on average, we have a constant amount of work, but there are periods of time that there's no work running. So there is some respite for the, work, for the CPUs to kind of catch up. Uh, it's when you see sort of the convergence of the average and the minimum that we know that there's a sustained amount of work. So yesterday I was working on uh, a customer where you know, they had some average number of units of work waiting to use the CPU was like 45, and the minimum was something like 35. So that's an example of latent demand where the guy just was not able to catch up. But there were other times when the average was 45 and the latent demand and the minimum was zero, just meant everything kept caught up. So that's typically due to um, the bursting of activity or an influx of work that gets handled. So there's different ways of looking at this. The main thing you wanna look at though, is this average number because looking at the average number, let's say here, this interval of time, if the average number of units of work waiting to use the CPU is over 50, let's just say, I don't know what this is, do I say here? Oh, in this case, this is three logical processors. So I have three logical processors on this particular LPAR, probably three logical processors on the machine even, uh, yet I have over 50 units of work waiting to use those three logical processors on average. Yes, it bursts up higher, it goes down lower, but think about that. On average, I have 50 some odd units of work waiting for three CPUs to do that work. That is the definition of latent demand. But another way we can look at it is understanding the queue depth and, and what those queues look like. Because I said, you can have latent demand, but in, when, when, you know, latent demand is just backing with the queue. But let's take those three CPUs. If I have three CPUs and they're all busy and I have latent demand, but my queue length is on average a length of six, okay, there is latent demand, but there's you know, two units of work for every CPU and it's sort of keeping up. That's a very different type of latent demand than if I have three CPUs and my queue depth is 50. That's a very different latent demand. But we know that queue is not a constant length. It's going up and down and up and down. And what this particular report is trying to show us here is what percentage of the measurement interval was the queue a certain length. So in this particular case, the x-axis is time but the y-axis is percentage of samples because that's what the sampler is doing, but you can think of it as the percentage of the measurement interval. So if I look at it all the way in the right hand, left-hand side here, I see very high light, light green. And if I look at my legend here, light green says work units, which is TCBs and SRBs, is less than or equal to N, where in this particular report, what N is equal to is the number of online, unparked, zip, and CPs. It's very unfortunate IBM does not make available the zip number away from the CP number. So we have to kind of think about that. That gives a little bit more calculation we have to do, but just know it's the number of processors. So in this case, what this green is saying that there's no queue of work and because it's near, let's say 98%, I can say that during this period of time, 98% of the measurement interval, there was no queue of work. When we look at these red areas or blue areas, we see different queue depths. So in this particular case, the lighter colors tend to be a lower Q depth, the redder colors tend to be a deeper Q depth. And we can see here that, do I have queuing? Yes. Do I have severe queuing or not severe queuing? And what we can say here is, yeah, you have some severe queuing, but only for maybe 20% of the measurement intervals that are really bad. The other queuing is sort of moderate. The rule of thumb I use when we do our evaluations is we like 
to keep the Q lanes to less than two times the number of logical processors. Now, there's additional calculations to that depending upon your zips, if they're busy or not, and if you're using SMT, and that's a whole different discussion. But think of it as two times the number of logical processors. And in this case, I think I have three logical processors. So if I get rid of the intervals where I say anything two processors or two, um, uh, two logs, two, I call it, two depth, two, uh, two units of work for every processor. If I have three logical processes, I'm only going to care about Q depths greater than you know, six to 10 in this case. So I remove the series for anything less than six to 10 Q depth. And what, what I'm left here is what percentage of the measurement interval did I, did I have unhealthy latent demand, meaning above my guideline, and how long were those Qs? And so we see that during the period of time that we had that busyness, we see here that yes, we had Q depths, not terrible Q depths, because sometimes they're in the, you know, the teens and the twenties, but then we also had some pretty bad Q depths. So it's really a lot of latent demand, but we don't see it as let's say solid red. If it was solid red, I'd be a lot, I'm not that I'm not concerned about this, but just know that a solid red would be a very different indicator of latent demand. If I superimpose those two charts over each other, what I'm looking at here, is again, the MVS utilization along with the LPAR utilization. And then we know during this period of time, we're tapping from that other report. But what we see here is if I look at my unhealthy latent demand, notice that the unhealthy latent demand is during, due during these periods of time. And that just goes to show you the relationship of the latent demand and the Q depth um, accordingly. Um, another thing we wanna look at when we measure latent demand is how it's actually affecting the workloads. What this particular chart is showing us is the performance index, it's a heat chart of performance index for workload manager. And the important color on this particular chart is the red color, which means we're missing the goal. In this particular case, it means we're missing the goal by more than twice the goal amount. So which means that we're, you know, assuming you have tuned goals, which I happen to know these are tuned goals. What we're trying to look at here is, let's see, all right, we know we have latent demand. We know the workloads are suffering from latent demand because we see the Q depth which workloads are suffering. We don't know how much of each workload, but we wanna see which workloads are, are not performing as well based on the workload manager goal. And what you see in this particular chart is, as I said, the red indicates the goal is being missed. And you see it being missed on a regular basis for a variety of reasons. Um, and always remember with performance indexes, this is a 15 minute average and workload manager does things on a 10 second mark. So it's, it's, it's only a, a feeling for the way things are running. Don't go crazy looking at these measurements in terms of PI. What we do here see is that during the period of time of our capping, during the period of time when we're 100% utilized and, and the weights are being enforced and all the other stuff I showed you, that notice that there's a lot of red here and the red coloring of the, of the pattern of activity on the right here is an indicator of latent demand. And now I get to see that all the workloads, or at least which workloads are being affected. But the most interesting thing here is that the, although we see some higher importance workloads affected, we see mostly the lower important workloads are affected more, which is what you wanna have happen is the lower importance workloads affected more by the latent demand. In other words, if you're gonna have latent demand, hopefully the lower important workloads are at the end of the queue and they're the ones suffering the latent demand the most. So then when looking at latent demand, we know we have it, we know we have a certain queue length, uh, we know the depths of those queue lengths and we know which workloads are now being affected, one of the good indicators we can look at is to understand um, the CPU delay samples to understand the severity of that latent demand. Because, you know, CPU delay is going to happen for all workloads. I mean, you can have a workload, an address space running at the highest CPU dispatching priority in the system. And I guarantee you that it will sometimes be CPU delayed for reasons like reduced preemption and fair share dispatching and other reasons. We, we, those, those, you're always going to have some sort of delay. The question is, is how much delay is the workload incurring? Is it a reasonable amount of delay? What is the delay proportional to the amount of work that wants to run? In other words, if I have a batch workload that is CPU delayed, I can be greatly CPU delayed because I have thousands of batch jobs waiting because I have thousands of active initiators, or I can have thousands of delay samples because this batch job for a sustained period of time just is not getting the CPU for whatever reason. So we wanna look at it always relative to the amount of work. But anyway, the point I'm trying to bring out here is if we look at this chart, these are CPU delay samples. Notice that we're talking about counts in the thousands and we look at it by workload. And what we notice is, is that 
we have different workloads being CPU delayed and two of the workloads that are delayed the most are in importance level five. We have importance level five DDF bat low, we have importance level five bat low period three, and that's what you kind of want to see. So if you have latent demand and you want to measure latent demand, please let that latent demand be for the lower importance workloads and that's what you want to see. One could argue that I have this sort of uh, peach color here for this workload, which looks like just some sort of discretionary, kicks discretionary. Why doesn't that have more delay samples? Probably because the demand on the CPU is not that great. So don't think because there's low number of samples here that this guy's not suffering. It's just that this guy's suffering, but his demand is a whole lot less than these other guys that are suffering a lot more. But as I said, notice here, one of the highest dispatching parties in the system Sys SDC is still going to get CPU delayed. So don't be concerned. We just want to make sure that the majority of delay is due to the lower importance workloads. And what we look at in cases like this <clears throat> is when you do have latent demand, one of the things we're always interested in is, okay, we looked at our goals. We saw the performance index. We saw the delay samples. How is the workload being managed? Well, another way of putting it is if I'm measuring my latent demand in the environment, one of the things I really want to understand is that I want to be able to control which workloads are actually going to um, be suffering most from the latent demand because they're being given the lower CPU dispatching priorities. So one of the interesting measurements to look at is let's look at CPU dispatching priorities over time. And so what we're looking at here is the same system. And the, 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 the lines here each indicate a different workload. This placement of the line is their CPU dispatching priority. When you see a chart line change, let's say you have this V here for this workload, whatever, whichever, whatever it is, this workload, um, IMS high in this case, it means that workload manager made a decision. So we always want to know that. But for the purposes of this presentation, what I'm interested in is what is the positioning of my different workloads? And what we see here is that DDF low, DDF bat, um, bat low period three, DDF bat low are all at lowest CPU dispatching priorities. So the point here is, is that if you know you're going to be suffering from latent demand and latent demand is just part of your environment, whether it be a burst of activity because the market opened or because it's, it's Black Friday and everybody's shopping or because it's just you don't have enough capacity on the machine, please at least let your lower importance workloads get the lower CPU dispatching priority, which means tune your goals so the higher importance workloads at least get first access to the CPU. And one of the ways you can check that is by looking at CPU dispatching priorities. What we then can look at is if you look at the CPU dispatching priorities, one of the other things we're interested in here is, well, how much CPU is actually being consumed by those workloads, right? Now, we know from the SMF72 measurements, we can look at CPU time by workload, but always remember those are 15-minute averages. What we're looking at here in this particular case is CPU usage on a 10-second basis, or another way of putting it is, Think of this chart as being a utilization chart, but instead of looking at utilization on a 15 minute average, we're looking at utilization every 10 seconds. And this is for one hour's worth of data. So this is every 10 seconds for one hour, what's the utilization and who's using the CPU. And we know the CPU is 100% busy basically. And we know now who's using it because these are my workloads. So here's an example, I'm drawing a black line because if I want to, you know, if I know the workload's being capped or whatever, I might want to even lower that cap because you can say, you know, I really need to limit the amount of CPU that these workloads are consuming because I, I need to save on my software bill. So I want to lower my defined capacity limit. What you can do with this type of a chart is understand, all right, if I know the workload and how much CPU they're consuming and assuming my CPU dispatching priorities are correct, then what I can actually do is understand that if I lower my defined capacity maximum, which workloads are going to be affected more by that lack of CPU or reduction of CPU, that those are the ones that are going to get more latent demand as I lower the defined capacity maximum. So one can see here, just pointing out that these lower importance workloads are the ones going to be affected most if I was to lower the defined capacity maximum, and I would expect their latent demand to increase. So again, just another way of looking at latent demand. This is getting a little more advanced. Let me just see what time it is. We are at the 15 minute mark. So we have 15 minutes left to go. I will be um, providing enough time for Q&A and hopefully you're finding this interesting. Um, but another thing about latent demand that we like to look at is the CPU consumed by a workload and its relative positioning of other workloads. Or another way of putting it is that 
you can see that you have a workload that is suffering from latent demand or a system suffering from latent demand. But if you're interested in how a particular workload is suffering, right, we can look at the CPU delay samples, but then we also want to understand that, hey, this guy doesn't have very many CPU delay samples. He's not suffering from latent demand. Well, it could be that his demand for CPU is just not very great. So in this particular case, what I look at is uh, I'm looking at a, a workload called DB2 control high, which is probably my, my uh, DBM1, my, my master, and my DIST address space. What the blue is representing is the amount of CPU in service units for one hour that this workload is consuming. And the gray above the blue is how much CPU is consumed by the higher CPU dispatch and priority workloads. The gray below the blue is how much CPU is being used by the, by the workloads at lower CPU dispatching priorities. So in this particular case, if I saw CPU delay, latent demand or whatever you wanna call it for this particular workload, I can be rest assured that this workload pretty much got what it wanted and left the CPU for lower importance workloads or lower CPU dispatching priority workloads, right? So yes, it was delayed, but at least we can see here when it ran, it got the CPU it wanted because it not only got what it wanted, but it got to use, leave a bunch of leftover. Why did it suffer from CPU delay? Why did it have latent demand? Probably things like dispatching intervals and reduced preemption and all those sort of concepts in the operating system. But take an example like this, where we look at a bat low, what we're looking at here is bat low, the blue is how much CPU service every 10 seconds bat low is consuming. The gray above the bat low, and by the way, the yellow indicates the CPU being used by work at equal dispatching priority, some other unit of work. The gray above is how much CPU is being used by work at highest CPU dispatching priorities, and the gray below is work that, you know, how much CPU is being left over by this workload. And what we noticed is in this particular case, this workload is not leaving any CPU left over. So the lesson here is, is that we can be CPU delayed in latent demand and not using any CPU, right? And getting CPU delay samples. In this case, we're gonna see the guy not only using CPU, we're gonna see him delayed for CPU. And now I know that because he's at the bottom, when he runs, he's leaving CPU for nobody else below him. So he's suffering from CPU delay as well. And chances are, when I look at his dispatching priority, I can now safely assume that work running at lower dispatching priorities that have zero service consumption don't have zero service consumption because they have lack of demand. It's that they have zero workload consum CPU consumption because they're just not getting the CPU. Do you see the difference? of being CPU delayed versus not just not getting the CPU at all, there's diff that, that different type of latent demand. You're getting CPU versus not getting it at all. Um, there's other indicators. I know we're almost out of time, but other things you wanna look at for latent demand and how to measure the severity of latent demand. On the left-hand side here, I'm trying to show you, you can look at your workload manager velocities. Typically during periods of high latent demand or delay for a workload, you're gonna see velocities drop. Another thing you can look at um, well, this is showing velocities as well on, the, on this one. Another thing you can look at is CPU time per transaction. Typically, during periods of time of latent demand, the CPU time per transaction goes up, which means the transactions are using more CPU to get the work done. See, the problem with latent demand is not just you're backing up from the CPU point of view, but because you're thrashing the process of caches, you're actually driving down the relative process capacity of the machine. You think you have a thousand MIPS machine, but when you have severe latent demand, you're actually driving the MIPS of that machine downward, to maybe let's say 950 or some number like that. And as a result, it's going to take more CPU time per transaction to run. And that is one of the cases where that's why you want to solve latent demand. And that's why you want to actually take a workload and hopefully give it more CPU so that its CPU per transaction doesn't increase because that's the whole point of the exercise is, you know, it's all about workload and, and using the machine efficiently. So look at CPU time per transaction. Um, and by the way, just want to point out as I close up is understand that when you look at latent demand, most of my presentation was focused on GP engines. Um, because those are the ones that tend to be the most expensive, you know, our software is being charged based on it. Um, but understand that you do have zip latent demand as well. And the reason zip latent demand is going to be especially interesting is that it can result in crossover that the workload could have run in the zip engine, but for whatever reason, it, you know, couldn't run. And as a result, it was put onto the CP engine, which then increases the CP CPU utilization, which then exasperates the latent demand you may already be having on those engines as well.
and there's different methodologies, as you probably know, to, to, to kind of alleviate that situation is, you know, turn off crossover or turn off crossover for a workload or do SMT or, or get more zip engines or, or increase the alternate weight management time period for the interrogation of the zip queue. All of those will reduce uh, crossover, which then alleviates the latent demand on the CP engine, but you still have to look at latent demand on the zip engine. So this is just looking at uh, utilization of the zip engines. And here I'm looking at high utilizations and I probably have latent demands. So that's when I look at things like crossover and min max average number of units of work waiting to use the zips and, and things like that. So these are the periods of time you wanna look at for zip engines because you really wanna see if you can prevent crossover of the zip workload, especially if you have GP engines that are already in a latent demand situation. One of the ways you can get rid of that latent demand is hopefully prevent the crossover. So hopefully that was a good presentation for you folks. I know I said a lot in a short period of time, but what I hope I did was give you a flavor of looking at latent demand on the mainframe environment. Um, understand that you know, most environments will always have latent demand, always have latent demand. It's a matter of the severity of the latent demand, who's suffering from the latent demand, and, and how severely are they suffering? Because you know, it's not always about having to buy a bigger processor because you can't always buy a bigger processor to alleviate the latent demand. Sometimes you have to make choices of workload tuning. So looking at latent demand, that's when you want to look at the queue depths and looking at the queue depths, who's at the back of the queue, is the right work at the back of the queue, and are they the ones suffering the most? So um, before we open up the questions, just remember to uh, fill out your session evaluation. I hope this presentation was good for you. Of course, if you have any questions that you don't wanna ask during the session, you can always uh, contact me afterwards um, and of course become a member of GSE. So any questions, anybody? Thanks, Peter. Um, just looking at the chat box at the moment, I've got nothing coming through. Uh, no just questions. <laughs> Let me ask a couple of questions of you folks. First of all, how many people have their own systems with severe latent demand? Anybody have severe latent demand? Anybody have no latent demand? I mean, I've, it's funny, I was working on a system. I've worked on two different environments these last few days. One environment, it was incredible how unbusy the machine was. I mean, they had a fairly large machine and this utilization of the machine was, I'm gonna say 15 to 20, 25% busy all day long, the entire week long. I don't get it. I mean, in this particular case, I did find out that, um, let's just say the salesperson was a very good salesperson. Um, and I find that very agree. You know, I don't particularly like when salespeople do that, but it happens sometimes. But it was interesting. I was actually working on an environment where um, the customer had to increase from 14 engines to 15 engines, um, you know, sort of the capacity on demand case. And it was really unfortunate because they really didn't have the money. But what was interesting is that the latent demand was so severe. And when I say severe, that, that, that distribution I showed you with the red, with the top red, the, the largest Q length that we measure is anything 150 or more. We don't know what the more is, but we know it's more than 150 units of work. And in their case, they had a uh, Q depth. It was like 99% of the time they had a Q depth of more than uh, uh, 150 with only 15 engines. And in that particular case, when you looked at the average Q depth, the Q depth on average was like 90 something. So, you know, it was going up and down, but it was just an incredible Q depth. Um, in that particular case, I was able to find out, or we were able to find out what was causing the problem, um, which was actually quite interesting. Um, so we were able to help that customer. So I give myself a pat on the back. Only, the only reason I give myself a pat on the back is because apparently IBM was in there for like a week or two and they had some other consultants come in and they couldn't figure it out. And Scott and I kind of were able to do that. So it's important to figure out what figure out what is actually causing that latent demand. And, and I hope, you know, and actually to be honest with you, for that particular problem, we used exactly the methodology that I gave you in this presentation, just the drill down methodology. And then eventually when you get down to the workload, you do have to do some additional research to find out why is this particular thing? Why is this particular address space, this particular transaction, this particular workload, whatever it may be, you might have to go to your application people. Why is that causing the latent demand or not causing the latent demand? Why is that incurring queue length? What is that? Why is that adding things to the queue? 
and not being handled as quickly as it should be handled. So that's when you go into the other part. So it's 25 past the hour. Again, any questions, anybody? Because I could talk all day long unless you want to leave early. <laughs> Yeah, if anyone does want to ask any questions, thoughts, comments, or any feedback, just feel free to leave it in the chat box. Or if you prefer to uh, speak, then I uh, can unmute you as well, bring you up on stage. Uh, but yeah, if anyone's got any comments or like to say anything to uh, Peter whilst he's here, then uh, please feel free. Nobody? Well, uh, just out of curiosity, I see we have people all through. Well, most people I'm guessing are in the UK. So hopefully everything's going well there. Um, just remember we, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to always ask me, um, if you want to see these reports and other reports about latent demand for your measurements, just contact me and I'll have you send me some SMF data and I'll put together a set of charts for you and reports and we can have a sit down and talk about it. So you can actually, we'll do an analysis. It's to get, it allows me to get to know you better. It allows you to get to know me better. Um, and just know that we're going to hopefully be together next year as we're in the conference next year, hopefully shaking each other's hands. So I just want to say, I hope everybody keeps well, safe and healthy. Absolutely. Well, thanks very much, Peter, for, for the presentation. Um, it was really informative and detailed and um, great examples as well. Um, as, as a reminder to, to everyone that's tuned in, as uh, Peter has already mentioned, please feel free to leave a session feedback using the session code 6AZ. And um, please do donate to the nominated charity as well. Um, I've left the links in the description box for that. Uh, we'll be back in here uh, in about half an hour to hear from uh, Chris Walker from IBM. So uh, yeah, if you can, please, uh, yeah, if you're able to make that, then that'd be wonderful. But for now, I think we can, uh, we can end it there if you're happy, Peter. Yes, thank you, everybody. I really, really appreciate you attending and feel free to reach out to me. I'd like to get to each, know each of you better. So thank you. Lovely. Well, enjoy and the rest of the Thank you to evening. you, by the way, for hosting. I appreciate it. <laughs> no worries. Take care. Have a great evening. And uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.